the sacrifice of Christ has produced. And that your presence in the church, your participation in the church, will keep the church righteous, godly, holy, sanctified. A true Christian church. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Our Father, we thank you once again with this your name. Thank you, Lord, for all you've raised up a church like this. Thank you, Lord, for making us part of a church like this. We pray, O oh Lord, all that you want us to be, all that you want us to do, all you want us to contribute to make the church a true Christian church, help us, Lord, to be willing and faithful and to do it in Jesus' name. We come again before your word and we're going to read your word. Lord, we pray as we hear your voice from through the servant you are going to use. Lord, we pray that we respond to that word appropriately in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life, every family, and every local church and whole church together in Jesus' name. Speak for your servants are here. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're talking about the church. We're talking about the Christian church. We're talking about the true Christian church. How do you recognize a true Christian church? How do you identify a true Christian church? What are the marks? What are the characteristics? What are you looking for, number one? If you're going to be part of a church, and you say, my heart is yearning, my heart is looking for a true Christian church, if I see one, I want to be part of that. What are the marks, and what are the characteristics? Or maybe you want to be a minister, or you're a minister already, and you're saying, I want to spend my resources, my life, I want to give my talent, my skill, everything I've got, I want to keep that to raising up a true Christian church. What are you looking for? What is it you'll be able to say? These are the marks. These are the characteristics and these are the evidence of a true Christian church. And when I'm used to God, a part of the church, and I contribute to that, then I'll feel fulfilled and satisfied that I've accomplished something. That's why we're looking at the true Christian church. And we look at the marks and the and the characteristics of that true Christian church. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 37 all through to verse 47. And you're going to see here the traits and the marks and the characteristics and the evidence of a true Christian church. It says in Acts chapter 2 verse 37, Now, when they had this, they were, they were preached in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They had just heard the word of God, the message of life. And Peter spoke the word without fear, without favor. He spoke the word without cringing, without any cowardice. He spoke the word with conviction and courage. He laid it on them. He said, you are the one that crucified the Lord. And then he said, now we have realized the guilt. We have realized the condemnation. We have realized the weight of our sin. What shall we do, men and brethren? What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission, removal, forgiveness of your sins. Of sins, then it says, And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Some people will say, Christ has done it all. All you need to do is raise up your hand and say, yes, I believe, yes, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is this or that. It's more than that. It says, repent. That is to turn away, look at your life, and look at everything that is dead and defiled in the, in the sight of the Lord, and turn around, and turn away from all those things. It says, repent, and then you receive the gift, the gift of salvation and the gift of his grace, and the gift of his love, and the gift of his son, and the gift of the Holy Ghost as well, for the promises unto you. 
the promise of salvation is unto you, of sanctification is unto you, of the baptism and the power of the Holy Ghost is unto you. The gift, every gift we are having from God, every gift is unto you, unto your children, and to as many as those who are far away or far off, as many as the Lord that God shall call. And with many other words, many other words, apply, apply the word to them, and telling them, this is the way you have gone astray. You see those pictures of those days, they are not trying to pet people, entice people, motivate people, just make people happy. He told them the reality of the world, how they need to separate from their past sins and then come clean and come clear unto the Lord. They were not trying to just make them happy in their sins. With many other words, he testified unto them, saying, save yourself, rescue yourself, separate yourself, withdraw yourself from this unto an evil generation. Then it says, they that receive his word with gladness. They gladly received the word. They were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them. How many people? There were 3,000 souls. And look at the kind of message that brought them unto the Lord. They spelled out sin very well and told them if you are going to be saved, if you are going to know the benefit of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out that you may come in out of darkness into his light out of all the degradation and defilement of the past into his own desire and out of all the evil things that you have done out of your sin you come to the righteousness of the Lord and he says gladly joyfully happily cheerfully they received the word and there were three thousand people then he says and they conceived the day that's the church this was saved that's the church those who realize we are no more of this world, we are gone to Christ, that's the church. Those who understand we are pilgrims and we are strangers in this world, that's the church. Those who are cleansed from their sins, those who are washed from their department, that's the church. Those who abandon their past evil life and they come to the Lord born again and saved and became new creatures in Christ, that is the church. And the people that remain, the people are abiding, not the people that came to crusade, they came to church, they came to covenant service of the new year, and then they raise up their hands, they are so happy, this new year God is going to give us this and give us, not that. The people that gladly receive the word of repentance, the word of righteousness, and the word of holiness, and the word of separation from the world, those are that's the church, those are the people they control steadfastly, not just, uh, you know, we have to be begging them, putting pressure on them, following them, offering after them, knocking at their doors, but on their own they came and joyfully they remained. Said first day, they were in, in prayer and they were in fellowship and to apostles' doctrine. These were not people that were pleading with the apostles, change the doctrine, that's not the church. They were not pleading with the apostles, modify the doctrine, that's not the church. They were not pleading with the apostles, this is hard and this is tough, who can bear this one. They are telling us to forsake Moses and forsake the law, forsake all those ceremonies and then come clean and come clear and make Jesus Christ the only Lord and Master of your life, the King of Kings and the Lord of all that's true talk. Give us chance and give, do it slowly. If we're even going to do that, why don't you graduate, make it gradually, little bit, not move the people. Not the people who are saying that they don't want to follow the word of God, those people that saw the doctrine of the word. And he says steadfastly with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. They were going to follow the word of God without modification. That is the church. Anything less than that, anything that you know, we gather crowds together, gather people together, you have to inject them, you have to motivate them, you have to make them happy, you have to give them some intoxicating kind of motivation before they can move on. That's not the church. The people that steadfastly continue with the word, that is the church, and that is what this church is going to be in Jesus' name. And then it says, they continue the apostles' doctrine, and they continue the fellowship, and they continue the breaking of bread, and then it says in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, fear came upon every soul. Not the people that don't fear God, the people that do not recognize the authority of God and the power of God. They do not recognize the justice and the judgment of God, but the people that fear God, and now they're living their lives in the fear of, oh, no, I can't do
do that. God will not approve of that. I can't say that. God will not approve of that. I can't go there. God will not approve of that. The people that have the fear of God, and it says how many wonders and saints were done by the apostles, and all that believe were together. We need to hear of high and low among them, rich and poor, among them, educated and illiterate, among them, IFL and the unfortunate, among them, everybody. They were all together. When they say this one is having this little standard, that one is having that standard, these ones are rich, they gentle with them, these ones, they are illiterate, so you can do anything with them. These ones are coming from overseas, you know, it is what they believe. This one, they are coming from the village, and this is what they believe. No, they were all together. That is the church. We're not talking about a kind of congregation amalgamated all these uh, people together. That one is that class, and that one is that class. You can't preach the truth to that class. You cannot preach a subscription to that class. You can't preach a subscription to this other class. You cannot preach a living life and living clean to this other class. And those other, be very careful. You can't talk to them or that. They were all together, and they believe the same thing, the same word of God. That is the church. And if this church is going to remain a Bible church, a New Testament church, a Christian church, a true Christian church, we're all going to come back together. We're going to say that this is the word for everybody, and we're going to stand on that word for everybody in Jesus' name. It's not like, you know, we are, we are women, we have this uh, women's section, and whatever they are saying over there, this is what you have said, this what you have said, and all that has said, we are the rich people, we are the financiers of this uh, church, if they don't count on us and make sure that they take, they take all the message according to what we're like, well, the church is going to remain in their little ramshackle kind of thing. Not, not that. The people that were all together and it's true for the same thing and they believe the same thing and they were going to hold on to the same thing forever until the end of their lives. That's the kind of church we have in the New Testament and that is the kind of church we're going to have in this place in Jesus' name. It says, I thought you were saying good amen to that. Are you the one you want modification? I said they want modification. They want you to you know this the day of civilization and technology and the day of this and that. Let's turn it down. You'll turn it down. I'm sure you will not. And I'm going to do that until I live in Jesus Christ. We're going to maintain this same Bible standard till the end of our lives in Jesus' name. And if the Jesus stands and I'm gone, whoever is there that takes over, I hope the rest of you have been watching. You've been watching them. Anybody that takes over from me and then they say, well, the man is gone. You know, that party fellow is gone. The one that keeps every jot and every teaching of the Bible, that one is gone. The one that wants to keep everything in the 20th century, 20th the first century, he wants to still keep everything. He is gone. I am the one here now. If anybody rises up, up the rest of us, all of you remain. I'll be looking at you from heaven. And if, if I go to heaven before, I'll be looking down there at your congresses, at your retreats, and I'll say, I'm going to see. I'm not going to take rest when I get over there. If I go there before you, I'm going to ask permission from Lord. Let me be watching them. What they are going to do with the message of the world after I'm gone. But the person is there, and, and you understand. Understand the people that are, we have authority because you know when we get over there we can talk directly to the Lord we can talk directly to the Lord Almighty and say and I'll say if I'm over there and then somebody comes in and he says well the fellow is gone I tell you I'm not gone Moses came back to that motor transformation and Elijah came back to that motor transformation I'll tell the Lord to remove him he will remove that person. Because this word, this word, we're going to keep it to the very end in Jesus' name. The true church, the rapturable church, the righteous church, the church that Jesus Christ died for, the marks and the evidence and the characteristics that the Lord is looking for, we're going to find it in this church. That in every village church, in every city church, in every locality there, in every country where we have this church represented, this Bible in our hand, from cover to cover, by the grace of God, in the strength and the mind of the Holy Ghost, we're going to keep to it in Jesus' name. And while I am alive, let me tell you, if there is anyone out there, anyone, any section of the church, 
If I have authority at all, I have authority in prayer. If I have anointing at all, I have anointing in prayer. If we cannot touch you, you know some people, if you cannot move them. If we talk to you, we try to say, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that way? And you're not, and you say, no, I'm not bold. You do whatever you do. Well, be God, we can talk to you. When we cannot handle you, I will pray. Oh God, you see what we're sacrificing for. You see the kind of church we're raising up because this is your commandment. This is the commission you have given us. And then we told him, do it this way. He said, no. And then he has all these people around him that we cannot do anything. And say, God, remove him because I cannot do it anymore. And you can do it. God will remove that person. Even while I'm still alive. Because this church will stand on this eternal truth. And nothing will change this truth in our hand in Jesus' name. The reason why we are here, who wants to waste his time here? You want to just stay here and waste your time and waste your life? Life is so short and he called us for something. And that thing he has called us for, we are going to stand on it in Jesus' name. What are we doing? We just pray to you retreat and then we labored and prayed for morning till evening, one message, the other message, the other message again. Then we came the following day, one message, another message again, and then we finished that the watch next Sunday we preach again, and then Sunday we preached again that preaching all the time. Who wants to waste his life if there is no Christian church? Who wants to waste his life if the truth of the world is not with us? I'm not into religion. Are you into religion? Why the Lord has brought us here, why the Lord has brought you here, so that the mass of the true Christian church and the mass and the evidence of the church of the New Testament, the Lord will raise it up in us. He is going to use every one of us to do that in Jesus' name. I didn't come here to entertain anybody. Congress is not for entertainment. Congress is not for clapping hands. Congress is not uh, to give us some motivation. I'm not here to motivate. Motivational speakers are out there. We are here to raise up a militant church. We are here to raise up a child culture. We are here to raise up a prevailing church. That is all I am for. I'm not for entertainment. If you came for entertainment, you can pack your load and go. If you came for the word of God, a change in your life, a transformation in your life, and you say, I want to be part of a church that is standing on this truth that can never change, though the people, the kind of people we're inviting. We want to invite people that should come and spoil our church. They want to come to me. They want to you only food and only this and only that. The church that will continue and the church that will stand built on the rock of ages that will never move by any fraud, by any persecution, by any vehement heat uh, blowing on us. Those are the kind of people we want and I pray that you will be one of them. And I say you will be one of them in Jesus' name. The church that is ready to pray. The church that is ready to bring that purity and holiness and sanctification. Bring it back to the church. The church that is standing on the totality of the word of God. Not only on faith, on healing, on deliverance, on prosperity, on peace, on that. On the totality of the word of God. That is the real church and that is the true church. And that is the church we are going to stand for till the end of our lives in Jesus' name. That's why it says in verse 46, and they continuing daily. They continued not only during the, the you know, Christmas time, they continued not only during the, the covenant month, they continued not only during the time they are in Lagos, they continued steadfastly, it says, with one accord in the temple, and in breaking of bread and from house to house, and did eat their meat with, with gladness and sinfulness of our praising God, and then he says, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added unto them, unto what? Unto what? Unto the church daily. Who are the kind of people added to the church? Such as should be saved. Those are the kinds of people the Lord is adding to the church, and I pray you'll be such a person in Jesus' name. I'm looking at this from three perspectives. Number one, conversion. Number two is consecration. Number three is continuation. Number one is conversion. Number two is consecration. And number three is continuation. Number one, conversion and acknowledge salvation. Conversion and acknowledge salvation. Salvation that is not to heaven. Salvation that is known to the Lord. Salvation that is known to your neighbors. Salvation that is known in your own heart. The spirit bearing witness that you are born again. You are a child of God. Conversion and acknowledge salvation. Then there is consecration and absolute surrender. The people who know him as Christ. 
They know him as Lord. They know him as King. They know him as Master. They know him as the owner of their lives. And they have this consecration and absolute surrender. And then you have continuation and abiding sanctity, abiding satisfaction. Continuation and abiding, abiding satisfaction. This is the true church. The church of where you have conversion. The true church you have salvation. The true church you have consecration. The true church you have open surrender. And the true church you have consecration uh, and uh, continuation. The true church you have abiding satisfaction. Number one again is conversion and at least sal sal salvation in a transformed church. In a transformed church, a church that has passed through the washing, the cleansing of the blood, a church that has passed through all that reformation, all that transformation, all that change, the newness that we have in Christ, conversion and acquired salvation in a transformed church. Number two is consecration and absolute surrender in a true church. If there is no consecration, if there is no absolute surrender, there's no true church. That's just like a club. That's just like a society. That's just like an assembly. But a real church, a true church, there will be consecration and there will be absolute surrender. Number three, continuation and abiding satisfaction. Uh, that we are satisfied with Christ. All that Christ offers, that's what we are satisfied with in a teaching church. In a teaching church. A church that will teach the word of God. A church that will not minimize anything. Those people are there, don't talk about this. Those people are there, don't talk about that. Those who are there, they can't talk about that. Well, what are thousands of people? Among those thousands of people, there are some weak people, don't talk about their weakness. There are some people who are sinful, don't talk about their sin. They are covetous, we don't talk about their covetous sin. Because if you talk about that, that will, that will make them have ill feeling. It will kind of rub them in the wrong direction. What are we going to talk about then? Well, we don't talk about all the things that God needs to change in our lives. But the people that understand that this is the true church, and it is a teaching church, and we come to the Word of God, and we teach everything without looking at the face of anyone. And that is the kind of church this church is going to be in Jesus' name. Give me a good evening right over there. Number one, what's number one again? Conversion and great salvation in a transformed church. You can see this, what the Lord has told us over there. It says, Save yourself from this other generation. And the people that gladly, cheerfully, joyfully receive that word, those were the people that are counted as part of the church. Why? Because and that's what is required. You saw what uh, the apostle told them, what he said, What shall we do then, men and brethren? What shall we do? And he told them exactly what to do. He didn't say, Just join our church. He didn't just say, Just put your name down. He said, We need your telephone number there. He didn't say, Well, you just tell them, just tell us that you are committed to us now. Any project we are going to have, you are going to be part of it. No, he said, Repent. And it is that word of repentance the Lord is still bringing to us today. If anyone is going to be a part of a church of the living, God, there must be that repentance. You look at your life, and we're not pleading with you. We're not begging. You know, when you beg people to repent, they, they, they have a, maybe a catalog of sins. They have about 70 or 72 or 73 sins, and you plead and plead, and they surrender. And, okay, I drop uh, you know, my cigarette. And then you, while you're talking and talking and pleading with them, motivating them, and saying, you know what? Uh, well, when we, when, if we repent, we get this salvation. We have joy. We have peace. We have rest of mind. If we have, you know, the uh, problem in families, you remove all the trouble and then at that sick about it. And then we go to heaven, we're going to walk on the streets of uh, okay, as you say that you okay, I drop another five and then you still have a six or something since me. The people on their own that say, I know a drop of sin, a little sin, only one sin will take me to hell. I don't want to go to hell and they turn away from their sins and repent. And then they say, Oh Lord, I need your mercy, I need your salvation, I need your cleansing. Those are the people that get converted, and those are the people that actually are called part of the church. Look at this in chapter 3 of Acts. Acts chapter 3, I'm reading verse 19, repent ye therefore, and be converted. It's the conversion that follows after repentance, turning away from sin, every form of sin in your life. And then you say, you come clean, you come clean, and everything that is evil, whether public or private, whether external or internal, whether visible 
or invisible, whether it is known to men or it is not known to men. You say, I repent, I turn away from them. It is that sincere repentance, that sincerity. It's turning away from sin that actually brings this conversion and this new life into you. It says, repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you, cause God, having raised up his son, Jesus sent him to bless you. In turning away everyone, in turning away everyone, in turning away every one of you from his watch. Iniquities, all the iniquities. It's when the Lord has done that. You have a church when he turns you away from all your iniquities. And, and there's a sincere following after the Lord. There's a sincere conversion, a sincere change of life and transformation. That if any man be in Christ, the new creature, all things are passed away and all things have become new because that is the ministry. That is the mission of what Jesus Christ came to do. Matthew chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It says in verse to one, and she shall come, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall do what? Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. He shall save his people from their sins. He doesn't save them into their sins. He doesn't leave them in the defilement, in the degradation, in their iniquity, in their evil. He will save his people from their sins. I know we're talking about dawn. We're talking about evangelization. We're talking about people coming to the Lord. How many of those people will say we're willing today? How many of them are getting the same kind of salvation that we got? The same kind of salvation that we experienced, that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, without any preacher running after us, without any preacher trying to say, I about this, I about that, I about that. So said it wholeheartedly from all our sins, we gave everything to the Lord because we knew that Jesus Christ came for this one single purpose. He shall save his people from their sins. And when we yielded to the Lord like that, we were saved and lives were transformed and everything became totally different. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading there from verse 11. When salvation comes, this is what that salvation does. If you are truly saved, this is what it has done. If it has not done this, you are not saved. You are not born again. You are just being church. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto how many people? All men teaching us that deny ungodliness and worldliness. When that salvation comes, you deny ungodliness. That means you say no to ungodliness. Uh, I'm not going to follow you to your office. I'm not going to follow you to your family. I'm not going to follow you to your village. I'm not going to follow you when, when it's become become a chief and uh, have chiefs in title. I won't follow you to the places to go. In the places where you have to give bribe, I don't follow you there. It is you, if there's still salvation there, that will say no, no to sin and no to evil. A preacher, the preacher that put before me now here, in our location here, he will say that someone was coming for the Congress and they saw a lady and they messed up his life and all that. We don't follow them where they go. It is the salvation in you. If you are really saying that, you know, will make you say no, you do deny ungodliness and what they lost. If you are not able to do that, it is because you are not born again. It is because you are just a church member. Forget title and forget I am this and that. Who made you that? Jesus didn't make you that. He interviewed you and somebody said, looks like you can be like this, can be like this. That one is the work of man. But the salvation the conversion that no man can do. That's the Lord that gave that to you. So if you discover that even though you are at this level, you are called overseer, you are called pastor, you are called minister, we make you that. And we can make mistakes. Samuel made mistake. When was to choose a king, we can make a mistake in choosing a king, in choosing a pastor, in choosing an overseer. The people can make mistake. And you can say that one is overseer and that one is pastor. And therefore, when you find out that a so called pastor, a so called minister is messing up with girls or ladies in the church, we just make mistake in putting him there. He doesn't have the mark of a real Christian. And Christ has not made him a citizen in the kingdom of God. And sometimes you find that they say that one is a worker, that one is this, and then we hear some terrible stories, like the story our brother was telling. And then you say, I'm surprised. Why are you surprised? 
That's what was an Ethan in the can. There was a Judas in the team. And because of that, some people say, I don't know about that salvation. I know about my own salvation. Do you know about your salvation? I said, Do you know about your salvation? The salvation that saves us from sin and takes away all that defilement away from our lives that the call of the Lord has called you to salvation. And it talks about denying ungodliness and worldly loss. And then it goes on to say in that verse 12, and it says, And we should live, but we live. How do we live? The salvation. If you know the frivolity of some people are not born again, and when they are in our midst, you will see them in the hostel. No problem. They just came in here and somebody put down their names and then they registered them. We can make a mistake in registering you to come here. And then you find the frivolity there, you find all the jesting there, you find all those uh, slander there, you find all those things there. And all the actions that, you know, as I stop wondering, you know, I used to wonder, I said, how can, how can he be that way? How can she be that way? How can be, how can be that? Now I realize, now I realize that it's not the choice of God that brought you to the Congress. It's the choice of man that somebody wrote your name and registered you and then you paid the right amount and then you came in over here and then they said, these are Congress participants, but not strangers to the parties of the world, and not bringing straight to heaven. It is the kind of choice that God makes, that makes us sober, and righteous, and holy, and sanctified. And when we see that, we say, that is a real child of God. And I pray that that mark will see your life in Jesus' name. How can we follow all of you to all your hostels and all the places you have come from? How do we follow you to the frivolous things to see over there and the lies to tell over there and all that and this and that? And then when your pastor is uh, passing, your overseer is passing, then you say, Well, keep right now, that's my overseer coming. Now, who are you deceiving? You're just deceiving yourself. And I pray that you're not going to the same place that Judas went to in Jesus' name. But it tells us here that when we're really born again, real children of God, they're waiting for the coming of the Lord. It says in verse 13 here, it says, it says in verse 13, it says um, that Titus chapter 2, verse 13, is telling us about the attitude of a real child of God. Now, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from how many iniquities? All iniquity. They don't tell me that you're a Christian, you're a real child of God. You know, I'm born again. If, if you knew my life, I used to smoke this and smoke that. I used to smoke, uh, you know, the weed and the marijuana. I don't smoke that anymore. I don't smoke the, you know, ordinary ones anymore. Now, you're not born again. You're not a child of God. Oh, you be sitting. I used to have, uh, you know, how many girlfriends I would have and mess up with that, mess up with that. But now, you know, I've reduced the number now. It's only this uh, last one. Uh, my wife doesn't know about her, but she is only this uh, last one. I'm still, you know, because it's very difficult to resist her. All the other ones have, you know, turned their photographs, have, you know, turned their letters, but just this one, that single one will take you to hellfire. And then when you get there forever and ever, you'll tell the story to all the people there that you tried, but she only this one will only take you to hell. I pray God will save you in Jesus' name. If you're looking for the Lord and say, I want to serve the Lord, all those iniquities, everything is gone. Because it says he gave himself, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And to purify unto himself, what kind of people? Religion, that's what, what kind of people? The peculiar people. Are you peculiar? Your office, are you peculiar? When you look at your character, are you peculiar? When you look at your dressing, those ladies that they, you know, say we're members of deeper life, where, you know, have you a member of deeper life? I, and I look at them and I say, I see any difference between your dressing, your appearance, and the people who are in the world there. If you didn't say you are deeper life, I'll just come to you that they are one of those other people that are out there. Because all the things that should be hidden, we see that, you know, your chest area, your, you know, all the other areas of your life, the anatomy of your body, we can see that very clearly. And I'm deeper life as which kind of deeper life not the one I'm generous to pretend it over but the one that God used me this is the thing that I saw the corruption in this land I saw the defilement in this land and God began to tell me what are you going to do with your life you want to become a professor and you want to you know stay in mathematics all your life or you want to do something that will bring a change a transformation in the lives of people and in the life of the nation and then I remember the finished Lord and Unilad where I went to pray where I made my commitment when the call of God came to me and I saw this 
great revelation of a multitude. I never saw a crowd like that in my life. And I saw a sea of heads like this. And then I, the Lord, and I even saw the kind of dressing I was wearing. They call it double two at that time in that revelation. And I saw that and I stood before the people. And then the Lord said, that's the people. I want you to bring the message of transformation and life unto them. And it was there at that tennis lawn that night that I told the Lord, I'm going to abandon all this and all this and all this. And the things started going to me. All that I just kicked off. And I said, this is what I'm going to do. You must understand, it was around that same year, not the following year, because this was 1973, that the following year, the university sent me to London, and they made the arrangement, and then they said, when this man gets there, Professor so-and-so, talk to him, that he'll stay over there for three years, we don't want him to come back until he has a doctorate degree to do this, because we saw something in him. When I got to London, then they began to tell me, the prof called me and said, did your professor in Unilac tell you that you have to stay here for three months? I said, no, I came for three months. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to finish in two months because I have a retreat waiting for me in December. I went in October. He said, what? And then they said, they'll pay your salary in Nigeria. They'll give you salary in London. They'll give you this. And give. I said, no, that's not for me. And then the fellow was, he said, why? I said, I have a calling. He called because I've seen the vision. I saw the glory. I saw the people. I I saw the holy and righteous. And I said, Lord, I will do it. And since I said I will, if I, if I don't want to do something, even with a human being, if you talk to me and I understand you, and I say, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. When I say I don't want to, I never understand my background. I was trained by an atheist who never believed in God. I was stood I bought to I bought. And when he said, actually, when he said, do this, you can flog me from here till that time. He did. Blood was gushing out. I have the mark in my body today. And he said, William, I said, sir, do this. I said, no, sir. Continue to beat me until when he was tired, he left me. Three weeks after, I went back. I said, sir, three weeks ago, do you remember me? He said, yes. I said, look at the mark here. It's on my hand here. I said, I came to tell you once again. I didn't do that thing. And I will not do that thing. He said, my boy, I am sorry. And for that man to say I'm sorry to a teenager like me at that time, that was something. I wasn't even born again. But my name is William. A defender of the faith. A defender of the truth. And when I stand and I say, this is what the Lord has told me. And this is where I'm going. There might be a thousand lions in the way. I will get there. And you need to have the same mind and the same speed that this man said what the Lord called you for. If you're going to join me, join hands with me, and then raise up this thing. I'm the one that saw the vision. I'm the one that saw the people. I'm the one that saw that this is the kind of church the Lord wants to raise up to me. I told you this see the vision. If you're going to join hands with me and we do it together, well and good. But if you don't want to, why don't you find another church and say the holiness in that church is too much, the standard in that church is too much, the sanctification in that church is too much, and find another place because in this place is going to be the gateway to heaven. This place is going to be a place where resting of people that will have the mass of the true Christian church. And anyone that joins me, that wants to say, will do it with you, I say, come along. And if I see that spirit in you, the same spirit, the same heart, and the same excitement, and the same sanctification, and the same consecration, will walk along together. But immediately I see that this one came to destroy my vision. He came to destroy what the Lord gave me. I'll just pack you aside and go my way because when I go before the Lord Almighty, on that final day is going to ask me what did you do with the vision I gave you and I can say from 1973 to 2011 and 12 that God I thank you as long as it's in my hand I've done my best to make the church what you call me that it will be. Some people have loved me and some people have hated me some people have come near, some people have gone away I've had some people that are very close to me, I never knew I could leave one day without their support but they have gone and I'm still here and Going stronger and stronger, and in the name of Jesus, I'll see the keeping strong until the final end in Jesus' name.
if you want to come and if you want to say we're going to build that same church together, wonderful. And then, but if you say no, we're not going to, we're going to ruin it. And God shows me and says, sir, can you find your way to another place? Madam, can you find your place to another place? Because over here, we're going to do something that will have a mark of the true Christian church. And it's going to be like that in Jesus' name. That's why it says over here that he gave himself. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And then to purify unto himself a peculiar people, a transformed church. And that is what this church will remain to be in Jesus' name. You need to understand I have colleagues who are also leaders of other churches, I have colleagues who are overseers of other churches. We're very friendly, we're together. But you know, those early years we just worked together and we bled together and we did this together. There have been lots of them. But right now when I saw that this is the way they are going, and you know, we still greet each other. Thank you, brother, thank you, sister. I was still, you know, we still socialize a little bit, but then I said, This is the direction I'm going. And if I do that to those colleagues of mine that were together before and I say no because they're not following after what the Lord has called me for. And then you are now, this is your own chance now to prove yourself, to say that you have the same mind, you have the same attitude, you have the same goal, and you have the same passion in your heart that we're going to go together. But once I see that this one has come to destroy me, this one has come to hinder me, this one has come to model up the great work that I sacrifice everything I've got, I sacrifice it for. You think I'm going to be foolish? No, not at this old age, this old age. Everything that God has given me unto the very end, I'm going to keep in Jesus' name. I might lose you, I'd rather lose you and keep heaven. I might lose you there, I'd rather lose you and keep heaven. Because this church, the true Christian church, that we're raising up only the people that have that same mind. We're going to be together in Jesus' name. I go to point number two, that's the consecration. Consecration. The consecration and also the absolute surrender. Consecration and absolute surrender unto the Lord. I'm looking at Second Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. Let's see what consecration looks like. What real absolute surrender looks like. It tells us in Second, Second Samuel chapter 15 and verse 15. It says, and the King and the servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. He said, We don't have any will of our own, our will is swallowed up in your will. Our desires they are swallowed up in your desire. We were your servants, and were your slaves, and were your followers, and were your disciples. And we are willing to do whatsoever, whatsoever, my Lord, the King, shall appoint. And when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you recognize Him as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords, and then you say, Oh Lord, here am I. What am I living for? Whatever it is in my hand, I'm not going to allow something good to hinder something that is better. I'm not going to allow mundane things of this life and the superficial things of this life to hinder the things that are deep and supernatural and spiritual. And therefore, whatsoever thou shalt command in my life, it may affect my character, might affect my family, might affect my profession, might affect my education, might affect whatever it is. Whatsoever, my Lord, the King shall command, shall appoint. I'm not going to look at how does it affect mommy? How does it affect daddy? How does it affect, affect my dear? How does it, does it affect my honey? How does it affect my wife? How does it affect my husband? Whatsoever the Lord the King shall command. That I will do. That's consecration. Not the people that, you know, will preach the word and will see black and white in the word of God. And then if I follow this, what will my wife say? If I follow this one to my husband's sin, I have these children, and then I made this consecration before they came into the world, but now my little boy is saying, hey, Daddy, why is it like that? And then my little girl, 13 years of age, 14 years of age, is telling me, hey, Daddy, we cannot follow that, we cannot follow you to keep alive, we cannot follow you here and there. And then they're saying, oh, you know, Pastor, I don't want to lose these children, I'd rather lose heaven than lose my children, I'd rather lose holiness than lose, than lose, than lose, than lose and lose my children. My children say that they can't follow this repentance. My children say that this kind of music that we have, that is just to give us heart to sing and they to be thinking about it. They say that kind of music is not alright for them. 
They say it's the jazz and the drumming and the dancing and all those uh, things they do. They say that is what they want. And they say this kind of, you know, a submissive life, a subdued life, a humble life, and then an appearance that looks like almost like Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then you are not looking like Jesus. Uh, they say we can't, we, can't, we can't go on with this. Pastor, what are we going to do? Why don't we change this to accommodate my children? You mean that you should change the standard of the word of God for millions of people because of your little daughter? Think about that. Think about that. They say, because of my daughter and because of, you know, these girls. They are saying, who are those girls? They study the Bible. Who are those girls? They know the original language of the Bible. Who are those girls? Have they met Jesus Christ? Have they seen the fourth heaven? Have they gone to heaven like Paul the Apostle coming back? Because of these girls, Pastor, if we can modify this and modify this for you, for the whole church, it's not that selfish. It's that it's wickedness to change the word of God and millions will go to hell because of you. Why don't you rather deny yourself at whatever you will do? God gave us grace. I came from a background that I can't tell you all the story. And yet when I came out, I went through quite a lot to be able to say, this is the revelation of the word of God. The preachers and the Christians, they think it's easy. Also in, the, also in the church in London, they invited me. And I preach and preach and preach and put in some education. At the table the following day, we were eating. And then the people, they began to make fun. Then somebody said, I saw John Wesley tonight in my dream. And then he was preaching the holiness. And then the other people were making fun. And I looked at them. And I said, you know, you don't play that kind of pranks with me. You don't, you, if, if you come to the table, you don't take the Bible, the word of God. You say you're a minister in another church. I said, if you don't want it, we want it in Africa. And so I came back and I kept on preaching what I was preaching. That doesn't change me. And if I can do that with those white people, and I told them, this is where I stand, the word of God. And then you come over here, you are black, like I'm black. I'm likely to, I'm, I'm likely to be more educated than you are. Likely to have read the Bible more than you have read. And likely to have, you know, prayed more than you have prayed. And then you are now coming with your lack of understanding. And then you say, this and this. When you do that over there, just abandon them. I pray that I will not abandon you. That we will stand on the word of God. And when we preach that word, if it strikes your life. If it costs your life, if it does anything to you, you don't make fun of the Bible of the Word of God. You go on your face before the Lord and the guilty one. The Word of God is right. The doctrine of the Word of God is true and faithful. I am the guilty one and the one to repent. That means that your will is submissive, is swallowed up in the will of God. Not that you are trying to twist the hand of God and twist the mind of God and twist the word of God to suit ourselves. That's why the people said we recognize what consecration is, we recognize what absolute surrender is. And over here they said, the, the king's servants, and they said unto him, Behold, thy servants are ready. We're ready. I said we're ready. I didn't know those, you know, that day when the Lord showed me this great revelation. And he said, this is what you do. And, uh, you know, I was uh, going to give up, uh, you know, uh, be, becoming a professor and doing this and doing that. And the Lord demanded something of me. And I said, Lord, I gave everything. I, I, I not even read this verse at that time. But I said the same thing. I said, what do I have? What do I know? And they called me, whatever they called me then, for stars, brain, whatever. And I said, I got all that brain that put it at the cross. And all the future put it at the cross all the prospects have put it at the cross all the sending you but since i put it at the cross and i said lord i lay down because i saw a vision if you saw the same vision you'll give up anything i think the reason why we're not consecrated and surrendered to the lord is because you know we're so dull and we're so blind and our eyes and sight is so dim and we cannot see you've not seen it if you go back to the cross and you go to the altar and the lord shows you the all and he shows you the revelation of the future you drop uh, all these uh, minor things and little things, superficial things, uh, trans trans uh, transitory things that we are trying to hold on to, you will drop it in a moment and I pray that at this time that consecration will come upon your life in Jesus' name. And those things will drop down, you say, I'll never go back to them anymore in Jesus' name. See, since I dropped all those things, my mind never went back to them. 
and you know, it, it, great things, things that you know people are saying, how could you have that and just stop that and just stop that? I said, because there's a higher calling, there's a greater calling, and that greater calling, when it comes upon your life, that's exactly what you're going to do. You know, be arguing with the Lord for one week and one month and one year and five years and ten years. Who are you arguing with, King of Kings and Lord of Thrones, that you should be able to say, I consecrate, I lay everything upon the altar, and the fire of the Holy Ghost coming from heaven come to burn everything away and do that to your life in Jesus' name. I'm looking at the book of the Kings. I'm looking at uh, this one now in the first Kings chapter 20. Or Kings chapter 20. And I'm reading there from verse 4. I'm reading first Kings chapter 20 verse 4. Here is consecration. And there is what we say to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Master of our faith and the Master of our soul. The captain of our salvation. In the first Kings chapter 20 verse 4 it says, And the King of Israel answered and said, My Lord, O King, according to thy sin, I am thine and all that I have. He said, My will is surrendered to you. The consecration that he wants us to bring together as a real church, I cannot imagine any disciple of Jesus Christ telling him, hey Lord, that is too much, you cannot surrender that, that is too much, you cannot give up that, that is too much, you cannot offer that to you. In fact, when the people say it's too hard for them, this is too much of a saying, how can we receive this? Jesus said to the people, see others have gone, will you also go back? That's the good. And then Peter said to him, shall we go? You have the word of life, Peter. Now, sometimes it can come to you that the Lord is saying, well, if that is too tough for you, so will you go back? There are other churches out there in Nigeria, in Africa. There are thousands of denominations and churches. And that church is simple, and that church is easy, and that church is easy on their people. Why don't you go there? I can even tell you that. If you come to me for counseling, I can do like now me to rule. And then you say, Pastor, you know, I've been in this church now for some time, but you know, it, I don't know what is happening. My flesh is saying that, can I endure this? And my children are saying, can I, I can even suggest to you, well, Papa has gone back. Why don't you also go back? Has gone back to your people. Why don't you go back to your people? And after all, so and so is your cousin, so and so is your uncle. He has a church. Why don't you go and attend this church? I can attend that to you. I can say that to you. And it will be a test of your faith. And then you'll be able to say like Ruth. Don't tell me don't you trick me to go back. When you die, I will die. And it was when it now me saw the consecration, the absolute surrender of this one that she left you. And look, look at the result of that consecration. And it is why you are able to say that whatever happened, whatever the wind may be, I'm going to stand upon the word of God. That is when the power of God will come upon your life again. Give me a good amen. You, you know, sometimes, and I need to tell you this, some of our pastors, maybe if this is you, just allow me to talk, allow me to pray. They come to me and they say, Pastor, lay your hands on me and pass the anointing to me. I said, pass the anointing. They don't understand. They said, as uh, you know, Elijah passed on the anointing to Elijah, they don't understand. They don't understand. They say that, you know, you make all this consecration. They have no consecration. You make all this surrender. They have no surrender. And they make all, you make all the sacrifices. They have no sacrifices to make and they're still feeling big. I'm feeling great. And he say, you know, Pastor, you are getting older. Why don't you just lay hands on me and pass the anointing to me? It doesn't come like, look at Elisha. Elisha just followed. He let all the yoke of all sin and abandoned everything. All he was doing was pouring water on Elijah's son. Pouring water on Elijah. He wasn't even preaching. He wasn't even prophesying. He wasn't even walking miracle. Just pouring water. He was a big man. He was a person, a land owner. He was a person that had this great kind of outfit in doing his work. But he wasn't Think, uh, just praying what I like, and he said, What's happening to you? What, what came upon you? You in look at this Elijah, he doesn't know the profession you have, he doesn't know the profession you have. He said, Don't worry, don't worry. And then he said, The Lord is going to take your master away from your head today. He said, Hold your peace, hold your peace. It's not time for this country, it's time for me to lay everything down. He was checking and searching himself. He said, Anything I've seen, not laid down. Yes, I know I've abandoned all my oxen, I've abandoned all my profession, I've abandoned everything, but now. What is he that is left? And then eventually, this man of God said, Elisha, you know what? Today, I'm going to be taken away from you. But if it was some of us, because so familiar with the leader, that you say, you're just telling me now, what kind of leadership is that? You've been keeping that away from me. I knew that. And you didn't trust me. 
I need to understand that I did look at everything I learned, and you are just telling me at this late hour. They told me already, I knew that already. Elisha didn't say that. Don't allow familiarity or nearness to be here. They make us, you know, why didn't you tell me that? Why didn't you say that? And because we begin to, you know, smile at you, they became offended. Is that leader, the sample relationship? Are you equals? Are you colleagues? Elisha said, I need a double portion of your spirit. And instead of the man saying, you're consecrated, you've left everything, and then it's going to happen, kneel down, let me lay hands on you. The man said, if you see me what I'm taking away from you. The man wasn't offended. This is what to call consecration. This is what to call absolute surrender. And then when he was going, he didn't even say, I give you anything. He just threw the mantle, and the man understood that mantle. Because it came on him many years before. He took that mantle, went to that same river, Jordan, and said, where is the Lord? God of Elijah, Elijah and then the seed parted and the other people can tell the power, the spirit of Elijah has come upon Elisha and he came to bend down but it took a journey, it took some milestones, it took some consecration, it took some absolute surrender before that thing came upon him anointing is not cheap Having the power of God is not cheap. And being used of God in this day, in this generation, is not cheap. And it is not something we fight for. Sometimes, they, you know, the um, journalists, they come to, you know, they interview me and they talk to me. And, you know, because we, we interact with them, you know, they're doing good and want to affirm the goodness that they have. But they sometimes ask me a question. They say, well, you are going older. I say, oh, you know, I'm going older. They say, they look at, you know, your hair. I said, is that a sign of looking old? Because Somebody can be 35 and have this kind of hair. Have you seen that? Look at that man over there. He has this kind of hair. It's not up the foot. Look at that one over there. And these uh, ladies who are covering their head, you know, you don't see some of them are 29 and they have this kind of hair. This one doesn't say old age. What shows old age is inside here. When your heart is young, when your heart is on fire, when you say, give me this mountain, whatever your chronological age, you're still young and young at heart. I want to be on the front line, on the far in line. And you can tell, you can tell. All that vision I still remember, it was like yesterday. And that consecration. I, today, I can still give up anything. I can still consecrate anything. Um, when, a man, when a man can still give up anything, can chase anything, can abandon anything, can say, this is where I stand, I can still fight in the battle of the Lord at my age. That means I'm still young. In Jesus' name, I'm young. You know, many years we're still together here. And you, you younger people, come and dare it and run. And let us run a race together. And you other people, whoever will blow the vessel, let somebody blow the vessel for us and say, on your map, search, go. And come and see these younger people. They'll be breathing like this while I'm already over there. Praise the Lord. What I am saying is that if you are still young at heart, you want to give everything you've got to the Lord and still consecrate your life and still say, if God can help this man and sin over there on the stage, God can help me and God will help me in Jesus' name. I want you to be exactly like me. Paul the Apostle said, be like me, follow me because I follow Christ. And I can tell you, follow me because I follow Christ. Don't try to change me to be like you. Allow me to change you to be like me. Because if you change me to be like you, it will be a tragedy for this country in Nigeria. Think about that. You change me to be like you. He changes me to be like him. And she changes me to be like her. It will be a tragedy for this country. But if you allow me to stay where I am staying, don't bring me back from the mountaintop. Allow me to stay there. And then you say, I don't want to change that man. But I want him. I want the power. I want the authority. I want the anointings right, to change me. That's the kind of change that is going to be beneficial for this country. And for this country, and it will happen in Jesus' name. Number one is the conversion. Number two is the consecration. Number three is the continuation. I will continue. I said I will continue. I said I will continue. The power, the spirit to continue. The Lord will give you Jesus' name. Continuation and abiding satisfaction with a teaching church. A teaching church. I want to show you that the church of the New Testament was a teaching church. It's not a church of motivation, a change of just, you know, glossing over things. It's a church of petting people, patting them at the back. A church that gave itself to teaching. I'm starting from Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. 
Acts chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 1, we're looking at verse 1. It says, The former futures have I laid out your fillers of all that Jesus had begun both to do and to teach. Both to do and to teach a teaching church. I'm looking at uh, chapter 4, verse 2. In chapter 4, verse 2, being great that they taught the people. They taught the people. They taught the people. A teaching church. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, And they called them and commanded them that they should, they should not speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. It was a teaching church. We're looking at chapter 5 and verse 21. Chapter 5, verse 21. And when they had that, they entered into the temple early in the morning, and they taught, they taught, they taught. In almost every chapter, it tells you that that church, that early church, was a teaching church, and this church will remain a teaching church in Jesus' name. It tells us in chapter, in chapter 5, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 42. Chapter 5, verse 42. Here is what it says, the word thing. It says, daily in the temple, and in every house, they cease not to teach. It is for teaching. And when you have a church, that's a true church. That's how we have the marks and characteristics of a really true church because of the teaching. I'm looking at chapter 11, verse 26. Chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves for the people and taught much people. And taught much people. And so the church is going to be strong today. It is that teaching, it is that teaching that will make the church strong. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. We're looking at verse 21. Chapter 14, verse 21. It says, continuing, they confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in, in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. It tells us in the last chapter, the last verse, the last chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, that's chapter 28, chapter 28, and verse 31. Here is what he's saying about what Paul continued to do until the very end of his life, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching. Teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no man did what? No man forbidding him till the end of his life. He kept on teaching, kept on teaching because what to make the church strong, what to make the church set for us is that we keep on teaching that word of God. And we thank God so far so good. I said so far so good that since we started 1973 until this time, nobody has muscled our mouth, nobody has tied our mouth, nobody has put padlock in our mouth that we cannot teach. We keep on teaching, we keep on teaching, and what the Lord has done from that time until this time. We have not nobody has been able to succeed. Maybe they have tried, but they have not succeeded in saying, turn down that one, don't talk about that one, don't mention that one, don't mention that one, don't teach that one. But the grace of God so far so good that from the very beginning until this time, we have been teaching everything, every judge and every teacher. Everything the Lord has given us, we have been teaching it until this time. And between this time and the end of time, we will keep on teaching. We'll keep on standing up on that word of God. And if you're one of those people there, you are here and God sent you here to help me. God sent you here to hold up my hand like Aaron and all the held up the hand of Moses. You're not here to pull down my hands. You're not there to weaken me. You're not here to destroy me. You're not here to, you know, pull me away from the very center of the battlefield the Lord has called me to. You are here to lift up my hand. You are here to join along. And you are here to say, we're part of the vision. We're part of the calling. And we're going to keep on teaching whatsoever the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us. Can I ask you to stand up with me and stand up along with me that you say that you are going to keep on teaching. You will keep on encouraging. You will keep on helping. And you keep on emphasizing the same thing. It might demand something from you. It might demand something from your life. It might make you to say, Oh Lord, I abandon that. I jettison that. I reject that. I, I give that away. I give up everything that will hinder, hinder me from being a partner to this man. I'm being a helper to this man. I'm being a comfort. I'm being a, a kind of companion to this man. You want to stand on your feet. You want to be able to say, I want to stand upon this word of God. I want to stand upon this truth of the eternal God. And you want to say, oh Lord, here am I. I be everything upon the altar again. Show me the same vision you showed this man. And give me the same heart and the same passion you gave to this man. And give me the same earnestness. Earnestness contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints that this church 
church. This church will be a true Christian church for the rest of our lives. Your children will follow on. Your daughters will follow on. Your sons will follow on. Your wives will follow on. They follow in the public. They follow in the private. No people are here with us in the public and they do like us and they dress like us and they talk like us and they pray like us. But then when they get to the secret, there's something else happening there. They appear to be uncompromising the public, but they're compromising in the secret. They want to say, with all my heart, with all my soul, I'm going to stand upon the word of God. And those who are not friends of some doctrine, and those who are not sympathetic to some doctrine, they will not be my friend, they will not be my, they will not be my close partners. Only the people, only the people that are standing on this eternal war, eternal watch of God, the people that will not change. I swear to my heart, I change now. And the people that are going to say, I've opened my mouth and I've spoken to the Lord, and I'm not going to return. I'm not going to reverse. I'm not going to take back from what the Lord has given me. You want to give your heart, your life, everything you've got. You want to lay everything upon the altar. And you want to say, I want to be part of the church. I want to be part of the church. That to be the true Christian church, having the same, the same kind of life, we're saved, we're separated from the world, we're sanctified, we're spirit filled, we're spiritual, we're not carnal, and we keep on in the unity of the faith with the people of God. All that I need to do, all that I need to surrender, oh Lord, I give that, I give everything. I give my heart, I give my life, I give my home, my wife will support, my husband will support, my children will support, my friends will support, anyone that will not support this church and what the Lord has given us, we are going to just pack them aside and go on and move on because we have gone too far to change now, we have gone too far to modify the word of God, we have gone too far to change the word of God, let the word of God change you, let the word of God transform you, let it make you a part of this transformed church, a part of the true church, a part of the rapturable church, a part of the transmittable church, that the Lord himself in his power and the Lord himself in his glory will do something in your heart, will circumcise your heart again, will do that surgical operation in your heart that you say, oh Lord, I'm not holding anything back, I'm not holding anything back, I give everything of God, I'm going to stand, I'm going to stand on this word of God, I'll support the world, I'll support the doctrine, I'll support the life, I'll support everything we're doing, not that we're wrecking, and we're ruining, and we're destroying, and then we're pulling back, not that we're trying to weaken the man, and weaken the hand of the man that is holding up the standard, we're going to hold up the standard with him. We're going to be an encouragement. We're going to be a great support. Like Aaron and all, we're going to be a real support. And as Naomi is going back to where she came from, we will say, I'm going to go with you. I'm not allowing you to go alone. I will support you. I'll be a partner to you. Where you die, I will die. Where you live, I will live. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. God will so unto me. And more than that, if us, but any, but death, that's you and I. You want to give all your life, all your soul, everything you've got. You want to lay everything on the altar. You want to say, I want to be part of that vision. I want to be part of that progress. Progress in righteousness. Progress in holiness. Progress in sanctification. With all my heart, with all my soul, I want to surrender all that I've got. And I give all I have. I give everything to you. Oh Lord, that experience of sanctification, that experience of holiness, I'm going to maintain it. All my heart, all my soul, with all the members of my family, everything I've got, that little thing I can give that up, that little thing I can give that up, that little thing I can give that up, I give everything of God, I'm going to stand on this word of the Almighty God, give your heart and give your life and say, Lord, here am I, oh Lord, here am I, and then your will is swallowed up in the will of God, your passion, everything you've got, anything of the past that will hinder those visions, anything of the past in your life, they will be dear to you, you do like Paul the Apostle, and say the things that were given to me, those are counted laws for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the excellency of His grace and calling upon my life. The Lord is asking you that you give everything it takes, everything it takes, and say, so, Lord, there I stand. I'm standing upon the rock of ages, whatever wind may be blowing, and whatever stream may be upon the house. I am going to stand. I am going to stand. That's how the Lord, that's what the Lord will honor. That's what the Lord will honor. And the Lord is coming and is saying, Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? Why don't you do it? Others have done it. Paul did it. 
Moses did it, and he laid everything down. Even Abraham did it, and he laid his son of the God for sin. He laid him down. Jephthah did it, and he laid everything down. And the people of God in past generations, they have laid everything down. It's now your turn. It's now your turn. And the Lord is looking for people, the people they can use to broaden the vision. The people they can use to establish the vision. And the people they can use in this generation to be able to go and preach this word of transformation and this word of life and this word of power. He's looking for people, for men and women. Let him find you. Let him find you. That you say, Oh Lord, here am I. I'm that man. I'm going to give everything I've got. I'm going to lay everything down. I'm going to serve you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, with a circumcised heart, with a submissive heart. I will surrender that. Absolute surrender. I recognize the absolute ownership, divine ownership of the Almighty God. That's what God is saying. God is saying to you today, why don't you surrender everything, your heart, your life, your possession, everything, your future, so, so, surrender into the hands of the living God. And don't be arguing with the Lord, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't surrender that, I can't give up that. But you say, well, Lord, what is it? What is it? Jesus Christ, He died for me. He shared His blood for me. He gave up everything so that He can redeem me from all iniquity. And then He can bring me to a friend, a man, a woman that is zealous of good works. I want to experience that. I want to experience that. I want to experience that. I want to be that man today. I want to be that woman today. Let the Lord do it to your life. Let the Lord do it to your life. Let the Lord do it to your life. And lay everything down completely with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Everything you've got saying, Oh Lord, I give up everything. I give up everything. Circumcise my heart again. Sanctify me again. Purify me again. Take every impurity and take every desire that is not according to your will. Take it away from me and let me stand and let me stand on this word. Do that there will be no change. Give me a little thing, a little thing. Oh Lord, I give it up. If it's little, why don't you give it, give it up? Some people is a minor, all right. If it's minor, why don't you give it up? Some people after all, that's a little thing. Why don't you give it up? If it's so hard to give up, then it's not a little thing. Any kind of friendship that will hinder you in their sanctification of spirit, you give it up. Any kind of relationship that will hinder you in this forward march and what God is calling you to do, you give it up. Anything at all, your personal life, your family, anything at all, your place of work that is going to hinder the great commitment the Lord is asking from you, that will be a true church, that will be a Christian church, that will be a New Testament church, that will be a church that is going to be rapturable. Anything that will hinder that, you want to say, Oh Lord, I lay it once again at the altar, at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. But okay, what I this morning, or material things, or whether it is your pride, or your knowledge, or whatever it is, your tradition, or it is your background, you want to lay everything out to say, Oh Lord, here is where I stand. Here is where I stand. And Lord, and when you stand by your word, you stand by that word, you don't allow anything, whatever, to be able to set you back. You say, that's what I said. I've opened my mouth to the Lord. I cannot go back. I will not go back. The Lord is asking you today that you'll be a man like that. To be a woman like that. You say, Oh Lord, here am I. Oh Lord, here am I. Oh Lord, here am I. I never say that conversion. There must be genuine conversion. It saves from sin. It saves from sin. And there's no sin, no pet sin. You're still hiding there. There's no pet sin. You're still embracing there. There's no pet sin. You still love more than you love heaven, more than you love Jesus Christ. You say, Whatever it is, if it's my right hand, I cut it off. It's, if it's my right hand, I pluck it out. So that I'll be able to keep him. That's who you is a righteousness without which no man shall see the Lord. You give it up so that you'll be able to win the great crown, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, and the crown of glory that has come to prepare for his soul. You tell the Lord, oh Lord, to dare consecrate my life and you. I set myself apart and you. I give up everything, sacrifice everything on you so that the glory of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of the Lord will be reproduced in my life all over again. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. And say, oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. Oh Lord, I come. I'm not going to withhold anything from you. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender. Everything that you need to surrender. You leave everything upon the altar. Oh, oh, without reserving anything. You say, Lord, this is where I stand. So that, Lord, I'll be part of the vision. I'll be part of the vision of a cleansed church. 
of a righteous church, of a sanctified church, of a separated church, of a Bible, of a Bible church, a New Testament church. I want to stand on this until the end of my life. And whatever it is I'll be holding dear, whatever it is I'll be holding precious, whatever it is I'll be holding unto, oh Lord, I give it up. I just give myself a freedom for the sake of life eternal, for the sake of heaven, and for the sake of bringing thousands of millions into the kingdom and bringing the people into the kingdom that will be able to stand the way Christ also stand to stand and the kind of church ambition and the kind of church that he drank about and the kind of church he sacrificed for that this church or that kind of church holy and pure without blemish and without any wrinkle you want to tell the Lord I'll be part of such an army I'll be part of such a people I'll be such a kind I'll be part of such a disciples that will make this church what it ought to be tell the Lord tell the Lord tell the Lord open your mouth and pray open your mouth and praise the kind of the greatest prayer you can ever pray this is the highest prayer you can ever pray that everything once again will come to the way it was in the New Testament and they give up everything of it was precious to them they give up everything so that they will be the kind of men the kind of women the kind of disciples and the kind of servants of the Lord they ought to be we have ourselves to consecrate our prayers and we leaders and ministers and pastors to consecrate our prayers and we members of church and workers we need to consecrate our prayers that Lord this is how I'm going to stand I'm going to stand upon the world I'm not going to be playing a religion we're not going to be playing or joking it was superficial religion we're going to stand upon the word of God until the end of until the end of our life consecration every day cross bearing every day self denial every day and we're going to have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord for the rest of our lives one day at a time one day at a time one day at a time there will no, be no day of self indulgence there will be no day of self will there will be no day of rejecting the word of the Lord every day consecrated to the Lord every day consecrated to holiness and righteousness for the rest of our lives and then when the trumpet shall sound and the dead the cross shall rise then those of us who are still alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air because we have lived righteous and holy and purified and we have lived rapturable tra uh, translate, translatable lives that's what the Lord wants to do be part of the army of God part of the saints of God when the saints go marching in that will be part of us they will be part of us and then you bring many people to the kingdom while you are still over here in a day of opportunity and day of duty and day of responsibility that God will help you to be part of the army of the Lord bringing other people to know the Lord and to know his salvation to know his sanctification and know the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives in their lives